Hey everybody, welcome to Always Bored, Never Boring. The other day I reviewed Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the adventure game from River Horse Games, which is a lovely little role-playing game which serves as a good way to introduce people to role-playing games if they've never played them before, or as a way to play role-playing games with younger children. I kept my review completely spoiler free so as not to ruin any of the little surprises that the game has to offer, but I thought it might be useful to do a follow up video for anybody who is thinking of purchasing the game and running the game as the Dungeon Master or the Goblin King as it is referred to in this game. So what I'm going to do in this video is just run through the first few encounters that we had in our first ever game. I was playing as the Goblin King Dagnabbit, who had stolen all of the tea in the labyrinth and was holding it in the Goblin King's castle. My wife was playing a horned beast, basically Ludo, and my daughter was playing a very friendly worm called Wormy. And the adventure you are presented with in the book is divided into chapters, which are in turn divided into individual scenarios, and you will not see all of the scenarios in any one playthrough. Conversely, you may see some scenarios multiple times. It all depends on how lost you get in the labyrinth. But the first encounter is always the gatekeepers, which represents your heroes arriving at the outskirts of the walled perimeter of the labyrinth. The scene involves a long stretch of the labyrinth wall with a pond in front of it, much like the environment where Sarah meets Hoggle in the movie. And there is a dwarf called Gloam and a horned beast called Loma who are standing at the edge of the wall and they both want to convince the heroes to use a secret door that only they know about. And this is a very simple scene that serves as an introduction to role playing. It gives your players a chance to interact with some NPCs and there's nothing particularly to worry about. There's no puzzles or anything, but it gives them a chance to get into the swing of getting into their characters talking to different NPCs, trying to establish information, and also it gives them an opportunity to think about the environment they're in and to look around because the pond itself actually has some items hidden inside it. There are two randomly generated items you will roll on a table as the Goblin King or pick from the table if you prefer. My daughter and my wife did not think for one second to look in the pond. They had never played a role-playing game before, so it completely bypassed them that they would even have that opportunity. And that is something that I overlooked as the Goblin King to begin with. I tried to rectify it at the end of the scenario, but I'll get to that in a moment. The way this scenario works is Gloam the Dwarf wants the heroes to use his secret door, which he says is the smart thing to do whilst Loma wants the party to use her secret door, which she says is the wise thing to do. My wife and daughter chose to do the wise thing and they used Loma's door. And this decision, it's a learning tool for your heroes. It's not something really serious, but it emphasizes that decisions they make will have ramifications later in the game. Because if they use Gloam's door, any scenes or puzzles that involve devices, and architecture will be easier, while if they choose Loma's door, then any scenes or puzzles involving creatures and plants will be easier. Of course, they don't initially know this, but they know that they've made a decision, and eventually it should start to become apparent that that decision has affected their journey through the labyrinth. So all told, this is a really nice little gentle introduction. It gives them a chance to talk to some characters, it gives them the chance to make a decision which doesn't necessarily have devastating consequences but quite clearly affects how they will continue through the campaign and it gives them an opportunity to find some items and interact with their environment. As I mentioned my wife and daughter didn't think to look in the pond so I did do something at the end of the scenario just to let them know that they had missed an opportunity and to make sure that they were on their toes not to miss opportunities like that in the future. I basically had the worm make a spotting test because the worm had the spotting trait which allowed my daughter to roll with advantage on a spot check and as they went through the door the worm noticed that Loma was picking up items and chucking them into the pond and of course at that point they realized that they could have looked in the pond and they could have found some items but it was too late but of course from that they learned that in the future if there's something like a pond if there's something like a hole in the wall it's worth checking out, it's worth looking. I don't think this is a game that really penalizes you for not having particular items. Certain items can be helpful, you can use them to help solve puzzles, you can use them by saying to the Goblin King, 
okay, I want to do this and I'm going to use my length of rope to help me. And that might give them a better chance of completing a puzzle, but you don't strictly need those items. They're just nice things that you can have and nice things that help you to create new ways to solve the situations you're presented with. But anyway, having selected the door, our heroes go through the door and then they have to roll a dice to find out where they're going to go next. And we ended up at the hole in the wall, which is a tavern hidden inside a wall of the labyrinth. And this is a classic tavern scene, really. It's an opportunity to take on the role of a lot of different characters as the Goblin King, because the tavern is a neutral zone where goblins, dwarves, horned beasts, worms, they all gather together just to drink and have fun and they don't fight each other or backstab each other. It's a nice friendly place with a lot of different types of races and characters that you can really get into role with. There's even some helping hands at the entrance to the tavern which welcome all the new guests. The way that the Labyrinth Adventure Game works is that many of the scenarios have tables that you can roll against to randomise certain things, like you can randomise what type of people are drinking in the pub, you can randomise what kind of interactions you're going to have when you're there, or as the Goblin King you can pick, either from the table or making something up. I chose to roll on the table of quest givers and I rolled up a scenario that there were two goblin deserters called Milch and Mog who were drinking in the corner of the bar. And when my wife and daughter spoke to Milch and Mog, they found out they were being chased by a group of goblin soldiers and they wanted our heroes to scare those goblins away or in some way turn them back so that Milch and Mog could escape. This was nice because it was another chance to interact with some NPCs, it was another opportunity for me to ham it up and put on a good goblin voice, and it was a good learning experience for people new to role-playing games to try and eke information out of Milch and Mog, and to be given a quest. This was their first sense of being given something to do other than wandering around the labyrinth. And the way these quests work is that whichever quest you get given, on the next scenario that the heroes go to, the objective of that quest has to be added to the scenario. So I had to work on the basis that wherever our heroes went next, they were going to encounter whatever that scenario had to offer, but also there was going to be a group of goblin soldiers there that they would have to deal with. Eventually, after speaking to a few more people, at the hole in the wall, our worm and horned beast went back out into the labyrinth to look for this group of goblins. Unfortunately, they fell into a trap and they tumbled into the oubliette. And the oubliette is a really fun scenario because it gives you opportunities to randomize different prisoners in there, but it also gives you an opportunity to randomize a way to escape. There are actually six different ways to escape listed in the oubliette scenario. And each time you go to the oubliette, because you can go to these scenarios more than once, you would have to use a different method to escape. And of course, there's an opportunity for a good Goblin King to invent additional methods of escape. I will spoil how our heroes escape from the Oubliette in a moment, but I wanted to mention first that obviously because of the quest they were on, the Oubliette was also home to a group of bickering Goblin soldiers who had tumbled into the Oubliette themselves and they were trying to figure out how to get out. So my wife and my daughter started by talking to these goblins. They found out that they were looking for these two goblins, Milch and Mog. So they knew that this was the right group of goblins. And they knew that they would have to deal with those goblins once they had found the way out of the oubliette. In order to escape, they searched the environment. They found two skeletons hunched over a chess set. And when they attempted to move some of the pieces on the chess set, the skeletons sprang to life and began to uh, chastise them for interrupting their game, which had taken a good few years to play. And then my daughter found a glass jar with a hinged lid, which of course they took, but they didn't really twig at the time that it was going to be their method of escape from the oubliette. They continued to talk to the goblins and they talked to the skeletons a bit more. They kept asking people, how do we get out of the oubliette? And I kept telling them, you need to find the door. To which my wife would invariably say something like, but there isn't a door. And I would generally respond with, well, that's because sometimes a door isn't a door. And gradually I layered it on. Um, at one point, someone said, well, sometimes a door isn't a door. And one of the skeletons laughed and said, that reminds me of a joke. And at that point, my daughter suddenly had a moment. She just lit up. She sprang off the sofa and said, 
when is a door not a door? When it's a jar. And she twigged that you had to close the hinge lid of the jar they had found, at which point a magical door would pop into existence that would allow them to escape the oubliette. It was a really wonderful moment seeing my daughter solve this puzzle, use her knowledge of a joke that she had heard in the past to work through the process of solving that puzzle. She was so proud of herself and it really was a really lovely moment in the game. Of course, as soon as the door appeared, the goblins tried to leave, but my wife as a horned beast managed to stop them. And then there was another interaction where they eventually convinced the goblins that the best way to find Milch and Mog would be to head back to the center of the labyrinth because Milch and Mog would likely be hiding there because it's the last place they would expect anybody to look. I thought that was pretty clever. Of course, the goblins fell for that which enabled our heroic horned beast and worm to return to the hole in the wall tavern where they could tell Milch and Mog that they were free to leave the labyrinth in safety. This in turn rewarded our heroes with some extra progression that would allow them to advance more quickly through the first chapter of the adventure. And I think that's probably a good place to leave this little run through. I just wanted to explain some of the interactions we had, some of the early scenarios that we had, how the game eases people into a new role-playing experience, how it sets up NPCs, puzzles, and really just to give a sense of what you can expect to have to do if you're thinking of picking up this game to play as the Goblin King. As I mentioned in my review the other day, I think this is a truly lovely game. I think it's beautifully presented, beautifully put together, and really funny and clever. It is, I think, what you would expect from a Jim Henson's Labyrinth role-playing game. Hopefully, you have found this little look behind the curtain of the Goblin King useful or helpful or interesting or something. But regardless, thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed the video, please consider pressing the like button. If you've really enjoyed the video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I'll see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.